Greetings, this is Greg. Let's take a look at the performance of Nakajima's Ki-84 Hayate in terms of speed and compare it to various Allied fighters. I talked about speed a little bit in the previous episode, but need to cover it in more detail to account for all the variations in the data out there. Performance numbers for the Hayate, codenamed Frank by the U.S., vary a lot from one publication to another. It's not unusual to see a maximum speed of 388 miles per hour, nor is it unusual to see 427 miles an hour. In terms of World War II fighters operating during the same time period within the war, that's a huge difference. Compared with the Corsair and Hellcat, that speed range makes it either slower than both through a wide range of altitudes, or faster than all but the fastest Corsairs, like the late war Dash 4s. This means that in order to compare the Hayate's speed to the others, we need to sift through the data and find the truth about the plane's maximum speed. The commonly published 388 mile per hour number seems to come from this chart, which is a U.S. wartime translation from a Japanese Ki-84 manual. That maximum speed of 624 kilometers per hour is at an altitude of 6,550 meters, or about 21,500 feet. That number is also given here in a page from the same document, and it converts to 388 miles per hour. Here is the problem. This is for a Hayate with a Dash 11 version of the Hamare engine. It's a lower compression version with a compression ratio of about 7 to 1. It puts out 1,825 horsepower. It's not the more powerful high compression Dash 21. As viewers of this channel know, the devil is in the details with this sort of thing, and there are a lot of details associated with this 624 kph number, which are too often ignored. Not only was this the weak Dash 11 engine, but it's not even at its maximum power setting. It's running at a manifold pressure of only 250 millimeters of mercury. This engine makes max power at 400 millimeters. So that 624 number is more of a maximum sustainable speed than an absolute maximum. The 250 millimeter setting has a 30 minute time limitation, so it's not quite maximum sustained either, but it's nowhere near the absolute maximum for the airplane. If you don't understand manifold pressure in millimeters, you might want to go back to the start of this series. I covered it there. Note the manifold pressure numbers at 4,000 and 4,900 meters. Take a look at those because the numbers there are lower because of the supercharger speed switching and throttling. And of course, you can see the numbers fall off again above 6,550 meters when the second speed runs out of breath. We also have the complete power chart for the Dash 11 engine, and we can find its horsepower at any given point, which will be useful later on in this video. Here's a document showing the Frank reaching 394 miles per hour, but sadly there is not enough detail with it to use it effectively. We know this was at 350 millimeters of manifold pressure, but we don't know which engine it's running, we don't know what configuration the airplane was in, you know, was it carrying drop tanks or what, and we can't match this up to a power chart. Next up, we have the speeds from the U.S. Air Force Material Command in the factual data section of the report. This is the source of the often reported 427 mile per hour top speed. Now, this is a report from late 1946, so it's not some wild wartime guess. At this point, Material Command had a lot of Japanese documentation, and of course they had the actual airplanes which had been test flown. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that the Hayate used for testing was probably not representative of a typical wartime example. Plus, while I'm pretty sure the numbers here were from an actual test of the plane, and not just estimates, that is not 100% clear. The Ki-84 was a good design, but wartime examples were plagued by quality problems, low-quality metals, unskilled workers putting them together, and far more. I'm assuming you watched my earlier Ki-84 video. I explained it all there, so there's no need to cover it all again here. As you can see, the plane and engine were disassembled and put back together to either factory tolerances or, if those were unknown, they went with tolerances recommended by U.S. manufacturers. In the automotive world, there is a process called blueprinting. It's when an engine is carefully assembled to exact factory tolerances 
and often to the most optimal specs within the allowable factory ranges. Generally, this means getting clearances on the upper end of the scale and volumes of things on the lower end. For example, on a four-cylinder engine, you might have a spec that calls for combustion chamber volumes that are 48 to 52 cc's. And on the four individual cylinders, you'll find that they vary within that range. So what a blueprinter would do is make them all exactly 48 cc's. Um, that's actually called CCing, uh, not blueprinting, but it's related. So that way it's still within the stock specifications, but it's optimized. This process is a big deal in racing classes within which engine modifications are not allowed. Blueprinting isn't exactly modifying, but it's making everything in there as close to perfect as possible. The Ki-84 tested by the U.S. had an essentially blueprinted engine and airframe. Probably not blueprinted to the standards of a race car, I'm not saying that. But they went through this thing pretty carefully. Some components were replaced with U.S. spec stuff. Nothing too significant in terms of performance, but we can go over it for completeness. The pilot's oxygen system, the radio, and various instruments were replaced. Uh, certain fasteners were changed out to U.S. types. Some electrical switches and warning indications were changed, so nothing that really matters for performance purposes. When reading through this, I found the lack of fuel tank drains a bit surprising. The first day of pilot school, you learn to drain the fuel from the tank sumps before a flight to verify the fuel is not contaminated. Apparently the Japanese didn't do that in World War II, at least not the Ki-84 pilots, because the plane didn't have the provisions for it. This would reduce safety, although I suppose that in 1944 Japanese pilots had bigger fears than water and the fuel from condensation. I want to stress that they rebuilt the entire engine, propeller, gearbox, the supercharger, just about everything to exact design specs. Once completed, this plane probably represented the most perfect Ki-84 to ever exist. I'm surprised that all this was done. It must have cost a fortune. And they did this in a time when everything was moving to jets anyway. However, the fact that they did do it says something about the U.S. thoughts on the Ki-84. Clearly, they thought it was important to find any secrets the Frank might have been hiding. Consider that we did not see that done with the piston-powered German airplanes, not even the extreme examples like the TA-152 or Dornier uh, 335. So we have an essentially perfect Ki-84 used for testing. Not only that, it was tested with fuel superior to what the Japanese were using. The Japanese Army Air Force ran the plane with their 92-octane fuel. U.S. testing was done with 96-octane. I don't think that affected the power, but it certainly didn't hurt. The Franks engine, which was the Nakajima HA-45, or Hamare, was an unreliable engine during the war, and I think some of that was because the engine was right on the line in terms of knock limits, and any irregularities in fuel or certain engine parameters, cylinder head temperatures for example, would push it over the edge into knock and result in engine failure. A quote from a Nakajima test pilot found in this book says that when using 100 octane fuel from the Japanese Navy, the Japanese Navy had better fuel, which is interesting, uh, under those conditions the engine's reliability problems went away. That makes sense to me. Normally using higher octane fuel won't increase power unless the engine is encount encountering knock. With the US-96 octane fuel, it didn't knock, and with the perfect blueprinted engine, rated power was assured. More significantly, the engine was reliable. So, we have good data for an essentially perfect Ki-84 with quality fuel. Here is the speed chart. It tops out at 427 miles per hour at about 20,000 feet. I think the numbers on the chart could have been attained during the war if it was a really good example of a Ki-84, and especially if operating out of Formosa, or somewhere where it had the better fuel from the Imperial Japanese Navy. I don't think these numbers were typical. In reality, I think the plane was probably a bit slower. Now before we go any farther, I want to show how far ahead Material Command's test plane was as compared with the numbers in the Nakajima manual. I know, different engines, different power settings, but we're going to try and compensate for that with some pretty easy math. At any given airspeed, uh, correction, at 
any given airplane will have a speed increase roughly equal to the cube root of the relative increase in power. I'll explain this via some examples and then we'll try it on the Hayate and you'll see how well this works. This is a chart for a P51D and we're only concerned with four numbers here. The horsepower and speeds at sea level at 61 and 67 inches of manifold pressure. I know it's a lousy chart but power is about 1470 and 1630 at sea level. The corresponding speeds are 363 and 375. So let's divide 1630 by 1470 and we get about 1.09. Take the cube root of that and we get about 1.035. Multiply that by the speed you started with and you can see that's darn close to the speed on the chart. If you're not convinced this works, let's run through one more. Let's take a look at an F3A Corsair. This was the Brewster version. Remember, these did not see combat as their production quality just wasn't up to U.S. Navy standards. Now, like the Hayate, you could take one of these and overhaul it to the standards of the Corsairs from the other factories. I understand some folks at a museum in Colorado have done just that, which I think is fantastic. Anyway, at sea level, we have 1610 horsepower and 1940 at two different power settings. The corresponding speeds, 320 miles per hour and 338. So we divide 1940 by 1610 and we get 1.205. Take the cube root of that, multiply it by 320, and you get 341. Now that's within about 1% of the chart, so I'm calling it good. The point is that this works really well within the speed ranges we're dealing with in World War II fighters. It's not perfect, but it's almost always really close. By using this method, we can check that 427 mile per hour top speed and see if it's realistic. If not, we can get a good idea of how far off it is from reality. So let's take a look. At 6,000 meters, the Dash 11 engine is putting out 1,390 metric horsepower, which is 1,371 U.S. horsepower. 6,000 meters is about 19,700 feet. The U.S. report shows 1,695 U.S. horsepower for the Dash 21 at 20,000 feet. That's at military power, which is 250 millimeters of mercury. Now, I realize these two altitudes are 300 feet apart, but that's pretty close to nothing. And in any case, there is no altitude where the published metric altitudes match up perfectly to the U.S. published altitudes. So this is the best I can do. The Japanese manual shows 610 kph, which is 379 miles per hour. The U.S. report shows 412 miles per hour for 20,000 feet. So we have the numbers we need to compare the U.S. results to the Japanese. We have the speeds and the horsepowers at almost the same altitude. Now do the whole cube root thing to adjust for the extra power in the U.S. test with the Dash 21 engine. And that 379 miles per hour in the Japanese test turns into 407 miles per hour. Now that's not 412 but it seems to show that the numbers from the near ideal airplane that the U.S. tested and with 96 octane fuel are not worlds apart from the Japanese results. The difference here is only 1.2 percent, which is a pretty normal variation. If you compare tests of, or if you compare any two tests of any airplane in World War II, you'll find they usually vary by about that much or more. So I have to think that the 412 mile per hour number is realistic, especially for one of the better built Hayates on, uh, the Jap running on the Japanese Navy's fuel operating from Formosa, which is now called Taiwan. Now, what about that 427 mile per hour number for war emergency power at 20,000 feet? Well, sadly, we don't have a chart that shows exactly how much horsepower the Dash 21 has up there at that power setting. We do have numbers at various lower altitudes, and we do show 1,850 at 17,900. I'm going to assume that the plane still has that much up at 20,000 feet. That's an assumption, but a reasonable one, because we know that the U.S. report shows that the maximum speed for the plane occurs at 20,000 feet, and from there, speed at war emergency power drops off. So it's likely that the critical altitude for the supercharger's second speed was around 20,000 feet. So 1850 divided by 1371 is 1.35. Take the cube root and multiply that by 379 miles per hour, 
we get 419 miles per hour. I think that is a reasonable top speed for a Key 84. It's based on the facts we have for an airplane combined with reasonable aviation math. Furthermore, the number makes sense to me. The 8 mile per hour difference between 419 and 427 miles per hour seems like a reasonable gain considering the work the US did on that test airplane, essentially blueprinting the whole thing, and considering that it had excellent 96 octane fuel. For comparison, I'm still going to use the higher number because it is from an official source and it's probable that there were at least some Key 84s that were built that well from the factory, or some crew chiefs that took special care of their airplanes. However, I think that most Key 84s topped out around 419 miles per hour. Furthermore, that top speed would not be sustainable because war emergency power had a one minute limitation, which was pr initially anyway, it was probably three minutes later on in the war, possibly 10 minutes. Exceeding those limitations seriously shortens the life of the engine, but I doubt the Japanese pilots were too concerned about that. So that's enough about the Hayate speed. Let's compare it to some Allied airplanes, and as I'm using the very best test of a Frank, I'll try to do the same with the others here. I'll start with the Grumman F6F Hellcat. This is a Dash 3, water injected with 64 inches of manifold pressure. It's about as hot as Hellcat's got. This data is from the fastest test I could find. All of the tests vary a little. Some were a little faster up high, some were a little faster down low. Overall, I think this was the best one. As you can see, the Frank easily outruns the Hellcat at any altitude and it's not close. Also, the speeds for the Hellcat were measured via instrumented testing equipment, so don't think this is related to errors in the Hellcat's pitot-static system, it's not. Before you tell me that the Hellcat's speed was underrated, please watch this video. I cover that topic there, link in the description. By the way, all the original graphs will be at the end of the video. I made it this way because it's easier to compare the planes side by side. My graph here isn't perfect, but it's close enough probably within about three miles per hour at any given point, limited of course by my computer skills. Now I'll add in an F4U Corsair with water injection at 60 inches of manifold pressure. Now this was a pretty common Corsair configuration in 1944 and represents most of the Corsairs the Japanese encountered. As with the Hellcat, the data ends at 25,000 feet. Both planes could go higher, but the nature of naval air combat meant that they rarely did so. Certainly in battles with the Key 84s, they would have been in this range, usually pretty low. In terms of speed, there isn't much to choose here. At 25,000 feet or below, the Corsair Dash 1 and the Frank are within about 10 miles an hour of each other all the time. Both the Hellcat and Corsair were used by not only the US Navy, but by the British Pacific Fleet. However, the British also brought along some Supermarine Seafire 3s, so let's add that in. The Seafire 3 has a single stage, two speed supercharger without an intercooler. It's very much like an early Spitfire, or for that matter, about like the Frank, although the Frank has water injection and a lot more compression. The Seafire 3 cannot keep up in this company. So of these common carrier borne fighters, the only one that's really a match for the Frank in speed is the Corsair. It seems to me that even if we shifted the Key 84's line over to the left by 8 to 10 miles per hour, it would still be faster than either the Hellcat or the Seafire 3. That would put it behind the Corsair here, but not much. Now I want to add in three more airplanes. Here is the P-47N Thunderbolt, N as in November. This was the final Thunderbolt variant. It saw combat in the Pacific Theater and was intended to escort B-29s and it did escort B-29s. Now it's significantly different from the earlier Thunderbolts. It has an improved wing, more internal fuel, an improved engine with better cooling fins, and forged, not cast cylinders, along with a bigger, better turbocharger. I'll add it to the graph. These numbers are conservative for a November. This test was done at a very high weight and with wing racks installed. I'm going with it simply because there isn't much choice. There are not a lot of tests of these airplanes, and if they did encounter Franks, of course it would be with wing racks because they would have to drag the drop tanks to Japan. And once they dropped them, the Thunderbolts would still be fighting at relatively high weights because they would need a lot of internal fuel to get back to base. 
Either way, the Thunderbolt November is very fast at altitude, which is where it's designed to fight, and even down low, it's still pretty darn fast. Next, I want to add in the F4U-4. This was the final Corsair variant to see combat in World War II. It is a hugely improved airplane as compared with the Corsair-1. The Corsair-4 has about 2400 horsepower via water injection, an improved cockpit, a new ram air duct. The ram air duct is actually a lot like the Franks, but it's at the bottom of the cowl. The Dash 4 would often be packing four 20mm cannons, although you may see those cannons on Dash 1s, but they were far more common on Dash 4s. In short, it's the highest performing naval fighter of the war. I'll remove the others from the graph except the Frank and add in the Corsair Dash 4. And as you can see, the Corsair is always faster than the Frank, although up to about 5,000 feet, they're at least close. From there, the Dash 4's vastly superior supercharging and intercooling system make it no contest. Let's not forget that the Corsair was a very expensive airplane to build, and it had a lot of complexity involved in making it this fast. I have a video about that, which I encourage you to watch. I'll put a link for that in the description. Let's get the Thunderbolt in there. Now, let's add in the P-51D. It is, of course, packing a dual-stage, dual-speed, intercooled supercharging system for its Packard Merlin engine. Interestingly, there are very few tests of P-51Ds. By the time the D model rolled along, most of them were being sent to Europe, and older B models were still being used for testing. Thus, the tests of Mustangs at 75 inches of manifold pressure were on the earlier, lighter B models with 450 cals and no bubble top. These were 400 pounds lighter than the D model. However, I don't think Mustangs in the Pacific Theater ran at 75 inches anyway, so I'm using a test on 130 octane fuel at 67 inches. It has wing racks, which was normal. In fact, it's very rare to see a D model in the European or Pacific Theater without wing racks on it, so I think this configuration is reasonable for a comparison. As you can see, the D model is faster than the Frank, which makes sense. It's one of the fastest planes of the war. Although it's interesting to see just how fast that Corsair-4 is. Keep in mind there was an H model Mustang that was faster, but it didn't see combat during the war, thus it's excluded from this comparison. I have to draw the line somewhere, otherwise we would have the Sea Fury and Corsair-5s in this comparison. I can't fit all the data for seven airplanes in here, so I had to trim it down, and I had a poll on my Patreon page to determine which of the planes I should use to continue this comparison. The P-47N Thunderbolt got the most votes. That's a good choice as it was escorting B-29s and encountering Franks up until the very end of the war. With the second highest number of votes, we have the F-4U-1 Corsair. This is a great choice as it's a good match for the Frank and was very common, um, commonly operating from both land bases and carriers. The third choice was the Hellcat. It's an awesome airplane and it has some strong points that no other World War II fighter can match. Uh, primarily the fact that it has very similar performance to the Corsair and costs about half as much. Now I'm honestly glad the Seafire 3 didn't get many results. It's just way outclassed here. It's really an early war airplane in a late war fight. And if it's compared to the Frank, feelings are going to be hurt. Now a Spitfire Mark 9, which is of course a land-based airplane, so more comparable to the Frank, would be another matter. But I can't come up with any realistic scenario that would put Spitfire 9s up against Franks in World War II. Now the Corsair-4 is really too much for the Frank. I'm not saying it's a total mismatch, but we can only have one Corsair here, and the Dash-1 is just a better representation of what the U.S. and British had in theater, although Dash-4s absolutely did fight Franks. Now I expected a little more support for the P-51, but I get it, the P-51 has been talked about a lot, and as an escort for the B-29s, the P-47 November makes more sense. Before we move on, let's put up one last speed graph with the Frank and these three opponents that my Patreon supporters have deemed the most worthy. To recap, the Thunderbolt's numbers are at a very high weight. This is with full internal fuel, 550 gallons worth, full oil, the pilot, and 500 rounds per gun. In other words, it's the maximum possible internal fuel load. 
The Hellcat and Corsair numbers are about the best I could find and are maybe five miles per hour faster than some of the other tests of these planes in similar configurations. It's pretty simple. The Frank outruns the Hellcat and does so easily, so there isn't much to talk about there. The Thunderbolt versus Frank comparison is pretty easy as well. Thunderbolt is much faster up high where it would be escorting the 29s. Below about 7,500 feet, the Frank has the advantage in speed, although not by much, and it's my guess that the realities of the Frank's construction and fuel quality, plus the fact that the Thunderbolt, if at lower altitudes, would be at a much lower weight, would give the P-47 the speed advantage at any altitude, but I'm going with these numbers for the comparison. The Corsair Dash 1 versus Frank speed comparison is the most interesting one here. They're pretty even up to about 25,000 feet where the Corsair's data ends. I can't imagine a realistic scenario in which these two adversaries would meet above that altitude, although I do think that that would favor the Frank. At the altitudes where these planes would likely meet, which would be between 20,000 feet and sea level, they're pretty close. Each has the edge within certain altitude ranges. That's all for this video. There is a lot more comparative data to cover with these four airplanes, climb rates, dive speeds, and maneuverability, just to name a few. So I'll cover these subjects and more in the next installment in this series. I want to thank all my subscribers and especially my Patreon supporters who got early access to this and many of my videos, as well as access to the manuals I use when creating them. That's all for now. Goodbye and have a great day.